Hey you guys, time once again for another book review. Now, as I promised, uh, this is actually the third book in a trilogy. And I think when I did the last book, the second book in the trilogy, uh, you know, which was called The Hungry Ones, I was kind of like, yeah, I'm definitely going to read the third one as soon as possible because these books, other than the first one, I kind of feel like the first one you can just read as a standalone. But if you're going to read the trilogy, I would recommend reading them not only in order, but also reading them like pretty close together because... It's kind of cool because these books are so, like the mythology around it is like so complex, like the story, you know, and, and each one kind of explores different facets of it, that if you don't read the whole thing kind of one after the other, then you might lose it or not get as much like appreciation for it. So the book I'm talking about today is the third book in Chris Sorensen's Messy Man series. And this one is just called the messy man. So like I said, uh, I reviewed the first one, The Nightmare Room, which came out in 2018. And after, I guess, uh, the author, Chris Sorensen, saw my review of it and uh, was very appreciative because I thought it was an awesome book. And so he offered to send me the second and third ones in the series for free. So of course I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> free books. We all love that. And uh, especially when they're as awesome as these ones. So yeah, and he like even signed it and like drew little ghosties in there and stuff, which I thought was like super cute. But yeah, he's a he's a lovely person and a really nice uh, man and a really, really good writer. Uh, so this one, like I said, the cool thing about this is that because even though I read The Hungry Ones, the second book, not too long ago, I'm trying to remember because I put up a review of that one too. And I feel like it wasn't that long ago. It was probably like a few months ago. And I was like, yeah, I really got to get to the messy man like really quick because I still remembered like most of the stuff that happened in the second one. Like I said, this is one that you really need to read them all in order and read them close together because it's like so, they're so rich in detail that if you kind of like leave a long time in between or something like that you're gonna like not get as much appreciation maybe but this i really like this and i don't remember that i don't think the second one had this he actually in the very back of the book he gives you like a little nice uh synopsis there's a little synopsis of the nightmare room and uh you know then there's a little synopsis of the hungry ones in case you need like kind of a refresher uh which uh, was actually much appreciated because even though like i said i remembered most of the story but it was kind of nice to have some of the stuff so it jogged my memory a little bit. Now, so the interesting thing about this, so like I said, The Nightmare Room is based around uh, a couple, Peter and Hannah, who their son Michael had died of cancer. And uh, they move to like back to this, um, th to his hometown, Maple City. And they end up moving into like to take care of his dad, who's, you know, in a home. And they end up, uh, you know, li moving into uh, the dad's old farmhouse and like fixing it up and the place is kind of like haunted. Now, so the first one is sort of like a haunted house story, but with a little bit of a different twist in it in regards to what the haunting actually is. And like I said, I don't really want to spoil, it's, and it's hard to talk about like without spoiling everything, but it's not, it's not exactly a ghost. There's like some other kind of stuff going on. And like I said, it's the mythology behind this is like really cool. Um, and it's something that you don't see in a lot of haunted house novels. So the first one, like I said, you could read, the first one you could totally read as a standalone uh, story. But like I said, if you're gonna do the trilogy, then you just kind of have to like go all the way with it. But like I said, each of the books is its own thing, but I kind of feel like particularly, maybe not so much with this one, but with particularly with the second one, The Hungry Ones, I kind of feel like you have to have read the first book before you read that one. Like, I don't think you could read The Hungry Ones like on its own and, or, I mean, you might be able to, but I kind of felt like uh, you'd be like, what is going on? Or you wouldn't really get, like I said, you wouldn't really get anything as much out of it, I think. Uh, so the Hungry Ones, like I said, kind of did a little thing with, and I'm trying not to spoil the whole thing that it did, but it uh, it did kind of a thing with time displacement where you, it was kind of focused on a different character, like this woman named Jessie and her friend who bought this rundown hotel or motel rather, like a motor lodge in Maple City where this mass shooting, like a massacre had taken place. Then you had like Peter and Hannah and Michael who is alive because it's like a different timeline. Uh, and then they kind of like come there and start living there and then they have like a haunting experience too. But again, not exactly like ghosts. They're almost kind of like, I don't even want to call them demons. It's not really that. It's just kind of like, 
sort of like a ghost, but they were never people, but they can kind of inhabit people and like some of them like eat ghosts and things like that. So it's like a whole uh, thing. So this one, the messy man, uh, Peter is a character in this as well. Uh, but I kind of like that the narrative is split like pretty much 50, 50 between Peter's what he's doing now, uh, and the character of Ellen Marks. Now, Ellen Marks uh, was a character in the first two books as well. She's like a paranormal investigator, uh, you know, who can talk to ghosts and she kind of like they're talking to her all the time. Honestly, even though she wasn't in the first two books a lot, like she's just, her character makes like a big impression. She's like a really, really good character. And it's like easily my favorite character in the series. And uh, so I was just like, yeah, we need more of her. So I guess that uh, Chris Sorensen maybe heard that because everybody was talking about how cool a character she was. So pretty much 50% of this book, maybe more, uh, maybe 60-70% is following Ellen Marks, but it's only, it's following Ellen Marks back in 2003 when she was 11 years old. Now you might think that that sounds like, oh man, but it's actually really, really good because honestly, if you read the first two books in the series and you know like one a kind of like very like strange abrasive and yet also quite awesome chick like Ellen Marks is she's still like that like in her kid form uh she's still very much like that like her personality is very much like that so I really really like I think it was a great decision to focus on on her character for this even though she's kind of a little kid but like I said she's her personality is still you know noticeably her and I like too that her thing that she's doing is kind of like there's some paranormal ghost stuff going on with her thing too because it's almost kind of like her coming to terms or like discovering like how she you know can talk to ghosts and how she's learning to deal with it like as a child um so you, you got that aspect of it too but then there's also it's almost kind of like a mystery story so it's like really really cool but then it kind of goes back and forth with Peter too, because if you'll remember, if you read these books, uh, at the end of the second book, Peter had been like thrown back and he was like going back in time. Cause like I said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in this where I just, it's not exactly time travel, but where you can kind of go back and there's like different, uh, you know, timelines and it sounds it's so it's a little bit complicated to follow, but it's not like hard sci-fi or anything like that, but it's just kind of a thing where, you know, like I said, at the beginning of the hungry ones where you're seeing, you know, Peter and Hannah and their son, Michael, uh, who in one timeline, the kid died, but then because Peter like went back and, and did something like with the with the spirit that was inhabit like the dark spirit that was inhabiting him like he was actually able to go back and sort of kind of sacrifice himself in a way but not physically if that makes any sense like i said it's there's a lot of paranormal stuff and it's kind of complicated to explain without spoiling too much about it uh but he was able to kind of sacrifice a part of himself so that his son could live so there's like an alternate timeline so that's kind of what's going on in this one too so peter's timeline so ellen's timeline is in 2003 at least until you know toward the end like the third act like when their uh timelines intertwine but Peter is, I believe, in 1979. Like, so he got thrown back to, because um, like I said, and this isn't, well, I don't know, this isn't, isn't necessarily a spoiler because at the end of the second book, like he woke up like in this circle of stones and there was a young girl there and it was Willa. Now, Willa, I think, is his mom. Uh, so he's seeing his mom as a kid. So it's just kind of like, so we're following Peter's story him in 1979 and he's kind of turned up on the grounds of this kind of old abandoned church and there's this old guy who looks kind of like Santa Claus named Papa Fallow and he's he has like all these kind of kids like orphan kids that he's sort of like adopted that he's like taking care of and they all have different sort of paranormal kind of powers you know what i mean like Willa can summon uh whisper you know, the, which is, like I said, it's not a demon. It's more like a dark spirit, but not, it's, it's not bad. It's like helpful usually. Uh, and then like one, uh, you know, one of the kids can like heal people. And like one of the kids can like make butterflies. Like, you know, they, they all have like kind of different sort of quote unquote magical powers, not in a Harry Pottery kind of way, but 
you know, just in a little paranormal type of way. So he has this brood of uh, kids. And so Peter's dealing with that, you know, so while that's going on, then we're also going back and forth with Ellen Marks's story, which, like I said, is almost kind of more like a mystery because she's 11 years old. Uh, her father, who she was the closest that she loved him more than anything in the world. And she was like closer to him than anybody. Uh, he has passed away in a car accident. Like, I think it was a year prior and um, she's still really upset about it. So she's living with her single mom, who, to be honest, is <laughs> is not really the greatest. She's not, like, physically abusive or anything like that. But she's always just kind of like, you know, why... Just saying to the kid, like, why are you so weird? Why can't you be normal? Um, so And she's uh, real... You know, she's always, like, looking out for the next dude. Like, you know, jumping on the dick and... Uh, you know, she's super, super cheap. Like she just wants to buy all Ellen's clothes that she's going to like thrift stores, not thrift stores, but like garage sales and shit like that. And she's always kind of like yelling at her for being a weirdo. And so Ellen has obviously, uh, kind of closed up and is not, so is not real, uh, forthcoming with her mom about these burgeoning, like, uh, psychic powers or whatever, or, you know, or, you know, she's actually, she's kind of a medium actually, because I guess she can see ghosts and they talk to her and ask her for help and stuff. So what ends up happening that sort of kicks off Ellen Marks's journey as an 11 year old is she gets a birthday card from, that is ostensibly from her dad, even though her dad has been dead for a year and it's got money in it and everything. So, uh, she thinks this is really weird. And while they're at, um, obviously she doesn't tell her mom because her mom would be like, your dad's dead, what the fuck? Uh, so yeah, so she gets the card and then with the money, like her mom takes her, she's like, oh, we need to buy you some new clothes for school because your stuff doesn't fit anymore. So they go to like these, all these garage sales and Ellen finds this sort of like a reel to reel, uh, tape recorder type thing. And, uh, she really like, she's very drawn to it and she really wants it. So she kind of sneaks off and buys it and takes it in her room. And when she listens to it, it's all these weird little, um, the, the little, uh, reels, like the little recordings all seem to be like people singing hymns and stuff. But then when, um, she listens to one of them, like the one that she's kind of attracted to, there's kind of a screaming voice on it, uh, saying her name and also saying something about blind rock. She is, so the so what happens is she kind of becomes convinced like through some clues that keep uh, popping up that her dead father is leading her on this particular journey. So pretty much it's her um, trying to figure out like how she's gonna get to Maple City without her mom finding out about it because she wants to find out like what this mystery is. What's blind rock? Why is my dad? Um, you know, why, why do I think my dad is giving me signs? Like he wants me to go there. Uh, you know what I mean? Cause she's like 11 years old. So she has to like be wily and like figure out a way to do this. Um, so honestly, those were like the, the part with Peter was good too. Uh, cause he's like a really good character, but it's the thing about Peter is that because he's in all three books, but because sometimes it's like a different timeline or it's a different like iteration of him um so he's not like as you know and this isn't a criticism i'm just saying that he's not like a consistent character because he's always kind of well he you know it's like well is, is this the timeline where his son is dead or is this the timeline where his son's alive or is this the timeline where he's sort of merged with whisper like his uh or mr tell his dark spirit is he merged with that so it's so he's kind of like a little bit different he's like so you know he's somewhat consistent but he, it's always kind of like a different thing whereas ellen marks is a very consistent character and even though she's just a kid in this um she's very recognizably the, um, you know, the paranormal investigator character from the first two. So like I said, I think it's really, really cool uh, that we're focusing on her this time around, like most of the time. So, I mean, her and her journey, even though like she's seeing ghosts and she's following clues and stuff like that, you get uh, another appearance by Riggs, who was, who owned, I think he owned the bar in the first book that, uh, that Hannah worked at the Blind Rock Tavern. Uh, and he's a really good character too. He's also in this one. He kind of works in the library where Ellen goes in Maple City and like kind of helps her, uh, you know, do some research into what is going on, like with this whole Blind Rock thing that she keeps seeing. Cause she keeps seeing like, you know, and, and this kind of goes back to the first couple books too. It's just like this big massacre that went on on this particular piece of ground of people that kind of had magical powers. So it was this kind of thing. So that's kind of like um, where 
Peter and Ellen's story in this converge, you know what I mean? Like on this particular patch of ground where this massacre happened, I think back in the 1800s or whatever, or was it earlier? I kind of want to say it was 1800s, but maybe it's now I can't remember. But yeah, honestly, I'm going to say all of the books are good. And it's like, and I just feel like it's cool because even though it's a, it's very obviously a trilogy, all of the stories are interconnected, but each book is its, I don't want to say it's its own thing because you kind of have to read them all like to, to get the gist of everything. But I'm just saying that each one has its own particular kind of vibe, a particular kind of style. Like I said, like the first one, uh, The Nightmare Room, was kind of, you know, more like a haunted house story with a twist. Whereas the second one was kind of like, I guess it was like Haunted Motel, but it wasn't exactly that. I mean, it was ghosts, but then there was all this other kind of like stuff going on like in the you know in the spirit dimension and there was all that kind of stuff going on too uh whereas this one is kind of like part of the stuff in the spirit world uh part historical uh you know the about the massacre and everything and then most of it the ellen marks part is just like a creepy like paranormal mystery like while she's going on this journey like trying to find out what it is that her dead father is trying to tell her and honestly that was my favorite part of it all of the books are good. This might, ooh, I was, I was gonna say, I think this might be my favorite one of the series. It's hard to say because they're all so good. I mean, Nightmare Room was so good. And uh, that, that came out back in 2018. And it, it's amazing how much like attention that got when it came out because it's like, yeah, on a surface, it's kind of like, oh, it's a haunted house story, but it was like way more than that, like the mythology. And that book's so great. The second one's great. Honestly, I think because this one focuses on Ellen Marks, uh, largely, who I think was my favorite character. Well, I know it was my favorite character from the whole trilogy. Um, so I think this one maybe has the edge over it just because it's just, I don't know. It's just so fun, like, <laughs> like watching her, like, go through the mystery of, like, trying to figure out. Because, you, you know, you have to think even though her character, you know, equivalent in the other books was older and w had already well established, uh, you know, her talent for talking to ghosts and seeing them. Um, it's kind of interesting to see her talent like burgeoning and for her like learning to deal with it because she's like an 11 year old kid and she sees like horrible things. Like she'll see like a massacre. She'll see like a man on fire or something like that. Like she sees things that happen in the past and it's like horrifying for her and she has to like learn to deal with that so i think that was like a really good idea like a really good angle to come at it so it wasn't just kind of like more of the same it's the same character but you're coming at it from a different perspective and i thought that was like a really really good uh that was a really really good thing to do because like i said it changed everything up but everything in all three books still ties together which honestly now that i'm thinking about it is like really really amazing um that that it just like that everything ties up because this is a pretty complex mythology and a pretty complex story like i said there's multiple timelines we're like jumping back and forth in time it's not hor it's not terribly hard to follow i didn't find it that hard to follow but there is a lot of detail there is a lot of intertwining timelines and characters and stuff that you kind of have to keep track of to get all the appreciation out of it. So I think that's why it's cool that he put like the, uh, you know, the summaries of the first two books back here, just in case. Like I said, I remembered them, but it was good to have kind of like some of the details in here. I was just like, oh yeah, that's that person or whatever. And that's that timeline or whatever. But yeah, honestly, like the more I'm thinking about it, like I said, it's, oh, I really hate to say, but I think this might be my favorite one of the series. Like I said, just cause I, I love the Ellen Marks character. I love, I loved like her whole journey and I love how everything tied together in the end, which is, like I said, it's kind of amazing because these are, th these are like three kind of disparate books or different types of books, I guess. They're still sort of horror, they're still paranormal, but they kind of each had a different perspective or they each had a different thing going on. But in the end, everything is like wrapped up, you know what I mean? And everything is all tied together. And I thought that was like really, really awesome. But yeah, seriously, if you haven't read these, you really should. Like I said, the first book, The Nightmare Room uh, from 2018, is awesome and it's like that would be the only one that you could just read like on its own like one and done uh but if you're gonna do the whole trilogy which i would recommend because it is really is like a whole rich complex story and it's really cool like how the threads tie together then definitely read them in order and definitely read them just one right after the other so it's like one big long thing but uh yeah i think this might be my favorite so 
Honestly, it's just like, that's pretty kick-ass. <laughs> the third one is like the best one. But yeah, it's pretty great. Uh, so yeah, check them all out if you haven't. If you have, uh, let me know what you thought about them, which one's your favorite. Uh, you know, just let's have a discussion about it in the comments. That will do it for this Tomes of Terror book review, and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.